Journal entry number two of subject six. I've gained a few new faces, but none of them fit me very well. They're all fairly ugly. Must have been treated poorly in the man's care. They're all in pretty pitiable, almost wretched states. I'll take much better care of them, but I don't think there's anything I'll be able to do about their ragged and tarnished features. I've named them Frank, Hector, and Leah. Frank and Leah are married, or so I've imagined. Well, Hector hasn't yet recovered from the death of his wife. He's not quite ready to date again. The rest of the gang has accepted them wholeheartedly, even perpetually embittered Greg. And I'm glad everyone's getting along. It's uplifting. My spirit's been pretty low ever since I found out the man in the hole, my would-be publisher, is, uh, is, uh, is dead. He appeared again a few hours ago, beckoned me to the hole in the wall behind Andrew. His voice had carried through Andrew's face, and upon hearing it, Andrew began screaming in terror. I rushed over to him, plucked him off the wall, and put him next to Candace, who kindly helped me to soothe the poor guy. Then, taking another face, I dressed myself and I went over to the hole to greet my guest. Seen again behind the desk, in the sparsely furnished and harshly lit room, he asked if I had written out my thoughts yet. I told him that I had, excused myself so I could go grab the roll of paper, which I had hidden in the very back of the room, behind a mound of the hardened gunk. Bringing it back... I fed the roll through the hole and waited with bated breath, excited to hear what he thought of my journal. He warmly accepted it, smiling broadly with his beautiful, real, pleasantly natural face, and unrolled the paper upon the desk. I blanched and audibly gasped at seeing a few stains on the edges, but he didn't care. He wiped those away, and wiped away those that he could then began reading. His eyes scanned the paper hungrily, but his expression had relaxed, appearing neither impressed nor disappointed. I was beyond nervous, and I kept making unnecessary and occasionally even uncomfortable adjustments to my borrowed face every couple of seconds as I waited. Finally, he reached the bottom. He looked up to me, for a moment, he was speechless, expressively passive. A smile stretched across his face. He said that he loved it. I nearly fainted. I'd been so nervous. He asked if I would mind continuing the work, saying that my audience would be desperate for more. I told him that I had already planned to continue writing for as long as I remained here. His smile broadened. He was... He was really quite handsome. And he passed along a few more blank pages keeping the one that I'd given him. I accepted the new canvases gratefully and asked if he'd like me to focus on anything in particular. But just as he was about to say something, there was a knock from somewhere within the room and a, a look of annoyance overcame his face. He excused himself and he rose from the desk. And then he walked briskly to the immediate left of the hole out of sight. I waited still beaming with gratitude and pride at having my work complimented. I heard some whispering, the beginnings of some heated, though hushed exchange, followed by a soft thunk, which I thought nothing of in the moment. There were a few more sounds, most unrecognizable, and then he returned and he sat down at the desk. But it wasn't him. The person was wearing the same face, but it was now ill-fitting, too taut around the nose, too loose at the chin. And the whole thing was spattered with droplets of blood. The eyes weren't right either, they were now black and ugly. Whereas before they'd been green, glimmering. But before I could comment on the incongruities in his appearance, he asked if I wouldn't mind reviewing what he had discussed. And not wanting to seem impolite, I complied even though I knew that he wasn't the man with whom I'd been speaking moments ago. He nodded along, 
asking for clarification when I mentioned the new sheets of paper, which I showed him. Then he held up his hand in a gesture of pause, so that he could reread, read for the first time, the journal entry I'd showed the former wearer of his face. Upon finishing, he nodded, and dispassionately thanked me for my contribution. Then he told me that I was free to go. I thanked him again, with more gratitude than he'd shown, and walked away. I heard the hole get covered, so I went over to Andrew, took him from the temporary place on the wall beside Candace, and replaced him at his usual spot. He protested, I had apparently been in the middle of a conversation about sprucing up the room decor, but I wasn't in the mood. I went to my sleeping spot beneath Luke and Christopher, unrolled a sheet of paper, and started what has become this entry. I'm afraid. I don't know what's going on or who this new person is, but I don't think I like him very much. He had an air of malice. A subtly menacing demeanor beneath his interest in my work, which I... Suspect is feigned. If he sincerely is interested, his motivations don't seem to be the same as those of the other man in the hole in the wall. I don't know what his game is, but I can tell I won't like him very much. I just hope that he treats my work with care. I will continue to write. If only for my own relief and distraction from the dismal circumstances. The faces are, of course, asking about today's latest visit, but I don't think I'll tell them what happened. I don't... I don't want to upset them and spoil the good cheer brought on by the day's earlier arrivals. I'll continue to hide these from my jailer, as I do not think that he'd approve of them. I don't want him sealing my work. It's all that I have left, since I don't have my freedom. Or even my face. I hope tomorrow is better. Entry number three of subject six. He's taken all the faces. They're all gone. He didn't even leave me the one I'd been wearing. I have nothing. No face at all. My face flesh burns no matter what I do, no matter how much water I drink or how hard I try to sleep. The pain persists. It's maddening. I can't take it. Writing only helps a little. Keeps my mind focused on something else. Something just as immediate as the pain, but the pain is still here, eating away at my nerves, terrorizing me, and the light on the floor, the ever-present light beneath it, has, has gotten brighter. It's become nearly as intolerable as the pain, but I can't look away from it, because I need to write. Writing is all I have. Earlier today, while trying on all the faces so as to keep them from growing taut and unusable, there was a a knock at the door. I was startled because he hadn't ever knocked before. He'd always just come in, take what he wanted, or give me something and leave. And so I was thinking that the new man in the hole in the wall had decided to visit me through different means. I scrambled to put on a presentable face and then went to the door. But there's no knob on the door, no way for me to open it from inside, so I was only able to meekly call out, Come in! I hoped that he'd be able to enter from his side. The door opened slowly, gratingly, as if the, the opener wasn't accustomed to its cumbersome weight. I stepped back a little so to allow them some space to enter, and once the door was fully open, a figure stepped in. I didn't recognize the face. It belonged neither to him nor, nor to the new man in the hole on the wall. It was a normal face, but plainly not that of its wearer. It, the skin of the face and the wearer were different colors. I'm not one to judge a person's desire to change themselves, so I held my tongue, and I greeted them as cordially as circumstances would allow. I just used the facilities of my little enclosure a few minutes prior, and hadn't thought to dump a fresh chunk of grime into the little waste hole. I hadn't been expecting guests, after all, and the faces never complained. Not to me, at least. I'm sure they gossiped amongst themselves. My guest didn't seem to mind if he even smelled it at all and greeted me politely, complimenting my face, which he said I had fitted upon myself very well. 
I thanked him, I offered him some wall water, but he politely declined, saying that he wasn't going to be staying for long. That he just wanted to ask if I'd like to go for a walk. I was utterly stunned. I hadn't ever been offered anything, let alone a walk outside my room. Suddenly the walls, perfectly circular and draped with tattered blood, spattered and scarred faces, seemed oppressive, seemed suffocating. The floor now appeared to be, for the first time, disgustingly coated with grime and all manners of filth. The ceiling, unsettlingly dark and eerily immeasurable. Without hesitation, I shook my head in approval, and my guest stepped aside to allow me to walk out of the room. First. Immediately beyond the door was a long corridor. So dark and narrow that for a moment I thought that I had somehow begun walking skyward, still within my own room, which I still kind of believed to be some kind of well or deep pit. But upon hearing the door close behind me, I was assured of my forward progress into another area and continued on down the lightless hall. I heard my guest following, so I saw no need to turn around, but something told me that if I should... If I were to glance behind me, I'd see something I wouldn't like. So I kept my borrowed face and natural eyes forward until I suddenly came to another door. This one's strangely normal, not a thick slab of iron like the one that bars my room. Putting my hands on it, I felt that its surface was wood and raised in the center, em embossed with some kind of image. Its knob was cool, brass, and bulbous. Go on. Open it. Still unwilling to turn around, now feeling an instinctual perception of danger at the very idea, I obeyed the command and opened the door. It led into a room brightly lit for my eyes, which were, and still are, so accustomed to near-complete darkness, by an old but luxurious chandelier affixed in the very center of the ceiling. It was a dining room of some kind, with an ovoid brown table, brown chairs, a few feet away from the door, and a cabinet of china and other dishes, apparently reserved for special occasions off to the side. There were wooden shelves on all the yellow paper walls, and most of them were occupied by framed pictures. No two pictures held the same person, or set of people. There was a different person's portrait within each dust-befallen frame, and all strangely were positioned so that they faced the dining table, even if it required the frame to be precariously placed on the absolute edge of the shelf. The rooms smelled faintly of bread, pastries, the lingering scent of an earlier and undoubtedly pleasant meal. Go on. Have a seat. There was a sudden edge to my guest's, or rather, my host's, voice. So I quickly took a seat at the table just beside the china cabinet. My host sat across from me, his back to another door with decor similar to that of the previous one. The embossed image was that of a face larger than life, with a stern, almost fierce expression. There were no other entrances to the room besides the two doors, not even windows. Despite it being smaller, this room actually felt more spacious than mine. I suppose empty darkness can be just as physically confining as a cluttered yet well-lit space. For a few moments, we simply sat across from one another, looking at each other's false faces while saying nothing. Then my host cleared his throat and flatly laid his hands on the table, palms facing down. His shoulders rose and fell slowly, deliberately, as if he were steadying his breathing to calm himself. I felt a weird sense of animosity from him, but couldn't figure out what I could have possibly done to anger him. As far as I knew, I hadn't met him before. The face was wholly unfamiliar. Finally, when he had apparently regained what he'd lost of his composure, he looked me in the eyes and said, I know what you've been doing. His voice, which before had been as unfamiliar as his face, was now one I'd recognized. It was his voice. Up until that point, he had masked it perfectly. I hadn't at all suspected him to be the true identity of my host. Startled and suddenly feeling like I'd done something terribly wrong and was about to face a severe punishment, I raised my hands up above me as if there was a gun to my hand and began sputtering out unfocused apologies, but he banged his hands on the table. 
just once. But with enough force and violence that I immediately dropped my hands, shut my mouth, and went still. I was beyond terrified. He hadn't ever become violent with me, and I, weirdly, felt extremely uncomfortable and vulnerable within that room. Even though it offered more means of protection and escape than my own. My brother thought you'd be an interesting study, so I allowed him to sit with you. Had meant for him to just have one session, a little interview, but he became enamored and went behind my back to conduct another. I do not allow anyone to visit my subjects with any sort of frequency, and my brother was no exception. I had to rid myself of him. Violations of policy cannot be tolerated from anyone. And while curious, aren't worthy of rewriting policy, of making needless exceptions. So in a way, in a way, you killed my brother. I was just the tool that carried out the deed. I, I was floored. I hadn't thought for one second that there could be a familial connection between the two men. I had simply assumed that my room was some sort of nexus for other random places and that the man in the hole in the wall had been a random visitor. I guess the environment of my room, my diet of unidentifiable gunk, it messed with my mind. Looking him in the eye with as much sincerity as I could express through my now misaligned face, I said that I was sorry that I hadn't meant to cause his brother's death. He regarded me dispassionately for a while, shifting his own face to suit his preferences, and finally clapped his hands together and said, Well, no matter. What's done is done. Forgive and forget. But a punishment must follow. And while my brother has received his, you have not received yours. For a moment, my heart seemed to cease its beating, and my soul felt frigidly chilled as if blasted by some boreal wind. But just before panic could swell up and consume me, he pronounced my fate, which was not to be murdered, but something nearly as bad. With his smoldering dark eyes, he said, I'm going to take all of your faces. I, 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 I cried, even audibly protested, not caring if the tantrum would result in some physical reprimand, but he simply sat and patiently waited, and when the, the fire had died in my chest, I sat back in my seat and sulked. And after a few moments of this, he gestured for me to rise and head back towards the corridor. I complied. I went to the door I had come through. I ventured back into the lightless hall. I'm back in my room now. He took all the faces down one by one, and their confusion and protests were just awful to hear. Candace was particularly frightened. I almost begged him to let me keep her, but I knew that in doing so, I'd only make the others feel worse. Lastly, he came over and took the one I'd put on my face to meet him, leaving me with absolutely nothing. His parting remark was that I could still write if I'd like to, and that he'd still carry out his brother's mission. Sullenly, I said that I would. And so I have. The light beneath me, while brighter now, still can't cast enough light to show me what lies above. In the deeply and darkened shadows, but I feel like there's something new there, something I hadn't before perceived. I feel uncomfortable. Vulnerable. More so than usual, I have a, I have a lot to think over and a lot to digest. Based on my conversation with him in that nicely furnished room, I don't think I'm the only one being kept here in this... this... 
dungeon compound, whatever this is. My abduction must have happened two or three weeks ago by now, and yet I haven't met a single other imprisoned person. Only those two men and the faces. And now with my only benefactor dead, and my face is taken, I'm more alone than ever. I have no reason to hide the papers anymore, so I guess I'll just leave this entry by the door when I'm finished. There's no point in putting them through the hole in the wall anymore. No one... No one is there to receive them. Good night. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you guys like hearing stories being told here on YouTube slash podcast slash wherever you happen to be listening to stories being told, then you can always get some behind the scenes stuff. Check out twitch.tv slash Mr. Creepypasta, and sometimes I go live there. That's basically the end of the statement. <laughs> sometimes I'm live. A lot of the times I'm not. Sometimes when I'm live, I play video games. Majority of the time when I'm live, I'm attempting to work, but also I get wrapped up in talking about life stories or things. So if you ever wanted to know me outside of the th th this, then hey, uh, just check out twitch.tv slash MrCreepyPasta. And I want to give a big thank you, as always, to all of my Patreon subscribers on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs. You are the ones that allow me to do stuff like getting specific stories just for the channel. If you guys want to see more of that, then I would really, really, really love if you guys could help support on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta like some of these wonderful guys such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Chaos Arts, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Silty K. Sterlerson, Zachary Graphius, It's All About That Fucking Music, Gorang Trimagacy, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Dabbles Rat, Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Chelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Milver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Sicardi, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, the Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. You guys, as well as everybody if you look down in the description, and everybody that can even just give one dollar to be able to help things out, I really appreciate it. If you guys would like to join this list of names that I horribly, horribly mispronounce, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and honestly, even you guys who just listen, you watch, you comment, you like, you subscribe, thank you all. I really appreciate it. And sweet dreams.